Cheers. Hello, employed, the unemployed, and those looking for work. Thank you for tuning in once again to our newcomers orientation. Today, my team and I from Valuing Employees Incorporated will be discussing the many factors of why many employees and high-level executives are showing a lack of engagement in the workplace and what tools employees and management can use to make improvements. To, be, to begin, it can often be difficult to overcome fear of engaging in work settings. Lack of engagement amongst employees may fluctuate due to anxiousness about particular tasks or discussions, which is correlated with uncertainty, which can be solved with the use of a simple skill of transparent communication. If your employee engagement is low, it could be due to the fact that negative assumptions have been made within your employees that have not been quite addressed yet. Today, we will be discussing the lack of engagement in the workplace, how uncertainty is a possible cause of this outcome, and how to reduce uncertainty amongst employees and high-level executives to increase engagement in the workplace. I introduce Anna taking it away, explaining how uncertainty excuse me, uncertainty can lead to lack of engagement. Thank you, Edgar, for that introduction. To further explain the problem, a lot has happened in the workplace recently that have altered the way one lacks engagement. The most recent life-altering problem that has happened is the pandemic that is still currently call, calling for workplaces to work remotely. A reason this can cause a lack of engagement can be for several reasons, one of them being completely burnt out from being on the computer screen all day. For example, when the pandemic happened, I was just starting off school and all of my classes turned remote. So you can imagine being completely burnt out from being on the computer. Another reason disengagement has happened for years is the lack of interest or knowledge of the set work environment. In the blog written by the UC member, USC member, the author talks about reasons why there is a lack of engagement in the workplace. In a study they did in 2015, they reported that only 32% of employees are engaged in their work, and about 51% are not engaged, while 17% are actively disengaged. It states that the reason for disengagement can be because of two reasons. One, they wished they were working somewhere else while on the job. Two, they were actively looking for other work. The study was conducted in different categories based on profession and age. Now, how does this lead to inefficiency? People wouldn't contribute as much as they would. The lack of disengagement can, can lead to inefficiency in the workplace, which could cost the company dime. Not having the employees fully engaged in the work can cause incidents quality def defects and absences. But why aren't employees engagement level higher? I'm going to pass that to Edgar to further explain. Thank you, Anna. But why aren't employee engagement higher? That is the question. Many times employees will experience numerous things such as stress and a sense of lack of purpose within any kind of work environment. As you can see with this visual aid, 53% of Americans continue to work overtime. I know I'm one of them. I'm sure many of you are too. While 60% of employees say work contributes to a significant amount of stress in their lives, who else can agree to that? I know for a fact that I have struggled even in my, with my own finances, which makes me not like my job so much. I'm sure many can agree to that. While 60% of employees say work contributes to a significant amount of stress in their entire lives. I just said that. And 52% of those who are disengaged don't feel they are contributing to a meaningful way. Inefficiency in the workplace due to lack of engagement can stem from employees' lack of importance or value within the work establishment. When employees disengage, the overall success of any business declines in profits with the domino effect of production fails. If there is disengagement in the workplace, businesses can and will fall behind, costing the company product production and profit. In the article, How Employee Engagement Affects Profitability, author Matt Tenay 
suggests that employee engagement drives organizational success, profit, and customer satisfaction. Without employee engagement, a company would fail in productivity, safety, and customer satisfaction. Camille and Riley will now take will Camille and Riley will now take over how uncertainty will introduce how uncertainty theory explains the problems within a work environment. Thank you, Edgar. Hi, I'm Riley, and I will be talking about the uncertainty reduction theory and how it explains this problem. Another way employees disengage is because they will practice the uncertainty theory. An individual may dwell and spend time thinking about different possibilities or assumptions instead of focusing on their work. The uncertainty theory is a firsthand demonstration on how groups can be distracted from performing their best in a group environment. This is how the uncertainty theory can cause a lack of engagement. So what is the uncertainty reduction theory? The uncertainty reduction theory, according to Venditti and McLean, states that we tend to know more about others than whom we have interactions in order to reduce or resolve the anxiety associated with the unknown. This was particularly hard for our group because we were completely remote for all of our meetings, which prevented us from getting that much needed face-to-face -face interaction. A personal experience that our group encountered was the realization of how important hand gestures and facial expressions have with not only making connections, but allowing for easier communication within a group. Most of our team calls were via a phone call at first, so nobody really knew what anyone looked like or who they were talking to really. Eventually, we were able to connect via Zoom, which really helped our group develop. We were able to put faces to voices that we were hearing, and it allows our group to gain more chemistry than we had before. Now I will be introducing Cami, where we will be switching on and off to further explain the uncertainty theory. Thank you, Riley. From this theory, we choose to know more about others. Learning to work in a new setting with strangers is often scary, but because we don't know who these people are, out of curiosity, we interact with them to give them a chance. That is when we make those choices of adapting to said person or have the choice of disagreeing with them based on what we can benefit from these given experiences. Either way, it pushes us to be patient with others, building confidence towards the unknown, and to critically think about who they are as a person as time goes on. Like what was said before, individuals will often choose to work with people that they have already worked with before, which is why when a group of unknown people are put together, they often waste time creating assumptions about one another. Creating these assumptions caused the team to become more divided without us even realizing it. Whether it was assumptions about certain teammates or about working as a group, they often made us remain quieter because we didn't have the ability to quickly connect like many in-person teams do. The uncertainty theory is beneficial for groups that have prior connections. It creates motivation to communicate within a group because we have an idea of how team members may respond to a certain situation. Our anxiety lessens when we have experience with how someone will respond. Previous connections prevent us from overthinking and staying quiet, and instead motivates us to express our ideas as well as concerns that we have for our group. However, the uncertainty theory doesn't protect us from our own barriers that we may subconsciously put into place. One of the barriers we create having this theory in mind is our own experiences or our own expectations. <laughs> Using previous experiences Having next to nothing like it with a said person doesn't really affect too much of that relationship. But when we expect it, this creates a strained working environment. Therefore, it is best that we at least keep those expectations to ourselves and understand that uncertainty shouldn't influence the whole, whole ordeal. And if we expect not to be listened to, we will stop engaging. Providing an anecdotal example, all our members are capable of contributing to the conversation, and there's no doubt about it. However, some have developed imposter 
syndrome when one member has hashed out an idea that disregards another member's idea on purpose or does not do much to improve on that thought. This continued behavior, which was short term, leaves disgruntled members to work instrumentally rather than being confident to receive needed feedback. Fear is distracting and can cause withdrawal is what happened in our group also. With that thought, everyone needs to be mindful with what they say, knowing that some members will need time to be able to bring quality to their work. Not only is this behavior unacceptable, but it can possibly cause members to deviate and slow down progress for everyone else. This finale is then brought on by a lack of patience to understand the situation following less engagement. Now, engagement is just as easy to lose from others than to retain. Where do we go from here? Here, we have Gina and Ali to propose better results. Thank you, Cami and Riley, for that absolutely beautiful description of the uncertainty reduction theory and how that plays into our lack of engagement. So the question becomes, how do we solve such a complex issue? Trying to get everybody to feel comfortable enough to express their ideas in a productive manner is a pretty tall order. There's a couple things that we have devised as a group that we think would work best for your situation as far as reducing the uncertainty in order to drive your engagement. So number one, certainly just knowing about the uncertainty theory is going to help you out. They always say know your enemy. And in this case, the uncertainty reduction theory can not only be your enemy, but also your friend. If each member goes into the interaction knowing that it may be a little bit scary and that they are all going to jump to make expectations and assumptions about each other in order to reduce the uncertainty, everybody can identify their own thoughts and they will be able to categorize their thoughts as their own assumptions or facts. So knowing that the uncertainty theory is a phenomenon that occurs is a very important first step for groups to take for them to reduce their uncertainty and for everybody to be able to communicate with clarity and to know again what is merely an assumption rather than a fact. Which brings me straight into my second point. You need to learn the facts about your other group members. According to Vendetti and McLean in the Introduction to Communications textbook on page 102, the more we know about others and become accustomed to how they communicate, the better we can predict how they will interact with us in future contexts. For example, if you learn that Monday meetings are never a good time for your supervisor, you quickly learn to schedule meetings later in the week. If in the beginning, we as a group can come together and help each other to learn the facts about the way we communicate, what our schedules look like, the facial expressions we may make, this can all help to encourage our teammates to communicate with us in a more effective manner and also not discourage team members if there should be a little sign of struggle or frustration. Being able to give each other the facts in the beginning is very helpful to reduce that uncertainty and it plays into that uncertainty. While it might be your enemy, it's also your friend. If you know the uncertainty theory, the best thing to reduce it is by giving each other more certain facts to go off of. Which brings me into my third point, that task-oriented self-disclosure can build trust and reduce uncertainty. According to Dr. Dabby of peoplematters.com, self-disclosure creates an environment of trust, openness, and genuineness among dialogue partners. This could be done through a variety of ways, but I like to think of it, and my group likes to think of it, as a team bonding session in the beginning. Maybe you go around the circle and you share your name, your age, maybe what brought you into this group, and your ideas and passions and aspirations for this group. By everybody giving a little bit of self-disclosure in the beginning, it can be really empowering and allowing team members to engage. They've already done it once before, and they can now expect to be listened to, be heard, and everybody has contributed in some way. Having a successful team bonding interaction like this in the beginning of your group can set the precedent for more successful engagement in the future. If everybody starts off on a positive foot, you're more likely to end and continue on said positive foot. And the last point I would like to discuss is limiting opportunities to assume things about each other and using neutral and positive tones in order to discuss. If we allow assumptions to be made about us, the people who are making those assumptions are going to look for those, they're going to use their confirmation bias, and they're going to continue 
to confirm their own assumptions. So we must be extremely careful, especially in the initiating stages of our groups, that we don't allow others to make assumptions about us. We keep our faces nice and plain, neutral. We offer smiles and handshakes and whatever certain things that you do in your culture in order to communicate. You maybe hold off from committing certain faux pas and are a bit more self-conscious in the beginning of how you project yourself in order to allow others to not make assumptions about you. And these assumptions are driven by fear. According to Brandon Keegan of entrepreneur.com in 2021, he writes, at some level of our consciousness, we're constantly worrying about what happens next. That's not a sign of weakness. It's just the way we're born. Our brains are incredibly adept at noticing threats and letting the rest of our body know about them, end quote. And while that these threats were biologically high, hardwired for are lions and other people and the scarcity of food, this fear often comes into our daily lives when there is no real danger present. The fear of maybe not being heard, the fear of being cut off, the fear that our ideas aren't good enough to contribute. By allowing ourselves to give each other the facts, disclosing things about ourselves, and engaging in positive and lighthearted and uplifting communication, we can help quell each other's fears and reduce our uncertainty in order to boost the engagement and the overall happiness of the team. If everybody's afraid, nobody's going to be contributing. If everyone thinks they won't be listened to and what they're saying isn't valued, there is not going to be engagement and you may see the monopolization of the conversation by one or two parties. By limiting the assumptions that we can have made about us through our own actions, this can drive others to be empowered to speak and drive others to feel comfortable around us, which is the most important thing. If we're to engage, we must be comfortable enough in order to share our thoughts. For more on the solutions about how do we reduce the uncertainty and boost our engagement, I will be passing the mic to Ali. Thank you so much for elaborating there, Gina. Um, to start off, um, averting any desired outcomes regarding how uncertainty theory is important to be cognizant of how negativity throughout the entire process can potentially be damaging to anything of substance being produced by that respective group. To be briefly put into context, there are six stages of group formation summarized in sequential order as respectively being forming, orientation, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning stage. In respect to uncertainty theory though, the forming and orientation stages are the most pivotal in regards to how uncertainty theory plays its biggest role as the group can potentially be solidified or broken depending on how the group works with, another, with one another, as there can be disastrous results with people leaving or quitting quickly due to not finding or feeling out of place in their own group. In order to best facilitate the group working with one another, it's important to recognize that individuals tend to work best together when they're acclimated in their goals and methodology prior to pursuing an endeavor to ensure that all kinks and loose knots are handled. A big part of this is done by spending at least a part of your in initial interactions, getting to know one another by discussing the desired work ethic to approach any projects, your past experience with other groups and what you would like or not like to implement within this current orientation of your designated group that you're currently assigned in, and having simple conversation that's leisurely and respectful to come to common terms with each other without going so far as to totally derail what you came to do in the first place. Once these are achieved and a mutual level of respect has been established, as well as consensus of work ethic that is to be agreed or desired, then the rest of the entire process will be much more readily facilitated than otherwise. Thank you, Ali, for that great insight. And thank you to all you newcomers and old heads returning and tuning in to our Valuing Employees and Corporation Orientation for You Newcomers. Ali, please go ahead and conclude us in our or new orientation. Thank you. Oh, thank oh, you so much for a beautiful transition there, Edgar. Uh, to conclude, we'd like to emphasize that the way of navigating the workplace is entirely dependent on the way individuals initially react with each other from the very get-go when they first meet. Ensuring everyone is having their voice heard and that no one is feeling left out from not only the decision-making process, but also in regards to any potential comments, both compliments and grievances, uh, that used for input are put in a manner that isn't going to put anyone off in a major way. Once everyone is properly acclimated with one another, there isn't much that can thwart progress within any respective group, 
that also has an equally diligent work ethic that's agreed upon. Within our own experience as co-workers, we can definitely say that we've had to work out many differences within our group, but once those differences were successfully managed, we can say for certain that the rest of the journey was far more simplified and enjoyable, which is why we've been designated to provide this tutorial uh, to those beginning to come into the workplace here at Valuing Employees Incorporated. Likewise, we can say with respect to anyone else going through those same endeavors, the process and how you enjoy working with one another will be more or less the same if you follow our advice by getting any so-called uncertainty handled in a diligent manner. As all of chapter two illustrates in your introduction to communication textbook, you'll want your journey stage to go up seamlessly so you can have the possibility of working well together in the future, if not entirely as a group, at least those individuals that you liked in the first place. Don't forget to reference the aforementioned textbook assigned to you as much as possible, as well as any assigned readings as often as possible. Don't forget to ask questions when needed. Please remember, there's no such thing as a stupid question, only bad answers. We appreciate your time very much in listening to our advice once again within this video, and want to thank you so very much.